Welcome to another episode of the CSU's Be Advising Podcast. My name is Matt Markin, an academic advisor here at Cal State San Bernardino. And on today's episode, we're learning all about the Master of Arts in History. And we welcome today's guest, Dr. Jeremy Murray. Dr. Murray, welcome. Thank you, Matt. It's, it's a delight to be here. And before we jump into our questions uh, regarding uh, the MA in History, uh, let's learn a little bit about you. Can you talk about yourself and your background in higher ed? Yeah, I'm from uh, from New York, from upstate New York, um, and I went to SUNY Albany as an undergrad, State University of New York at Albany, um, and I think that that school did well to prepare me for Cal State and its mission. Uh, the state schools in New York are similar in a lot of ways to what we have here in California. Now, I was not a history major. Uh, I was an East Asian studies major as an undergrad, um, but history quickly became my favorite there. I spent... Um, uh, a year in China as a junior, and that directed me toward Chinese history. Um, and I had really wonderful advisors there, Jim Hargett, and then um, to uh, Columbia for my MA. And again, I had great, great uh, faculty there, Eugenia Lean, Madeline Zellen. Um, and then I came out here to Southern California to UCSD, uh, UC San Diego for my PhD in history. Um, and again, had really wonderful mentors and advisors, uh, Joseph Eschrich and Paul Pickowitz. Um, and that, I think, um, the, having those really wonderful teachers, wonderful advisors and instructors really made me want to do what they did. Um, and that, that got, me, got me doing this, um, watching them doing their, their writing and their scholarship. But also, they were all really remarkably committed to their students, enriching the lives and broadening the, 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 the horizons of their students. And so that, that really wanted me, um, that, that led me to want to be, want to do what they did. Awesome. And so at Cal State San Bernardino, we have the MA in history. How would you describe that to students? The MA is a, is a two-year program. It's uh, a very rigorous course of study. It's going to deepen the student's understanding of how history has been done in the past and how historians are doing it today as a scholarly practice. I think that's an important distinction. Um, in their first year, students are going to join um, join the conversation, join the discourse of how history is done at the highest levels of historical scholarship. Um, and then they're going to move on in their second year to do their own work, their own, and that could be a thesis, uh, could be a project, um, it could be a portfolio. Uh, most students uh, opt for the thesis option, which is a kind of traditional uh, option. Um, and in any one of these three, the thesis, the project, or the portfolio, they're going to produce original works of historical scholarship. Um, and they're ultimately going to publish their work on scholar works. Uh, many of them are going to publish their work in venues like the, the student journal as well. Yeah. And so before we talk about, let's say, the admission process with it, uh, maybe kind of going off of uh, what you were just discussing right now, um, you know, we have the MA in history, there's the uh, the BA in, in history, um, you know, you're talking about the thesis portfolio. Can you talk more about like um, other things students might be learning in their classes and maybe tie that into if a student might be like, well, what's the difference between uh, the BA and the MA? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I think in terms of the difference between undergrad and graduate level courses is um, the most obvious thing is that their, their depth of understanding of the content, what's actually going on, um, and, and just mastery of, of content that they might one day have to teach. Um, but they're also going to enrich, uh, deepen their understanding of, of how we know what we know in history. So the study of history and sort of make an object of the study of history. Um, sometimes we call that epistemology or systems of knowledge, but uh, not to get too too far into the weeds on this. This is the this is crucial for historians to to understand how we know what we know. This is a this is a very deep level of critical thinking. It's a crucial skill for for anyone to learn if they're getting ready to join. Um, uh, a, a sort of top level scholarly conversation or discourse. Um, they're critically examining sources. Uh, they're looking at trends in the writing of history, um, how how the time in which a work of history is produced can inform that work of history as much as the time that it's about. Um, and that goes for us today as well. Uh, and this is, I think, it, in in my view, this is why I really like the program. This is this is very exciting. Um, we understand 
the cultural landscapes, the political, social landscapes uh, that we inhabit today uh, and that we sometimes take for granted. And in this way, it becomes easier for us to discern um, historians' intent, but really any author's intent when we learn to read a source in that way. Um, and that can include, you know, a Super Bowl commercial or a serious work of scholarship and, and really anything in between. We get a sense of how to how to read that source and how to understand that source and put it into context in a really, really rich way. Um, understanding the, the long history uh, and the culture that, that gets that work um, in front of us. Um, undergrads start to do this, but at the graduate level, uh, these skills are, are strengthened, enriched. Um, and and deepened in a in a in a much greater way, um, so that they're pre prepared maybe to to teach it uh, or to deploy that that kind of methodology in their own scholarship or both. And let's say students are interested in applying for the MA in history. A lot of times we get questions in terms of like, do I need to have a certain bachelor's degree? Do I have to take certain classes before applying? Do I need letters of recommendation? What's the admissions process like? Yeah, this is it's. It's it's laid out nicely on the on the website, and the the main the main requirements are going to be getting transcripts, and I believe they can be unofficial transcripts, um, letters of recommendation, um, and when I say unofficial transcripts, that that is your your college university's undergraduate transcript, but it doesn't necessarily need to be sealed uh, in in its uh, you know transmission. Um, you can scan them yourself, I, I believe is what unofficial means. Um, and they're gonna need three letters of recommendation. Uh, two should come from former faculty. One can come from a non-academic source. Uh, they're gonna need a writing sample uh, that can be on, on any, any field of history um, or a related topic. I'll talk about that in just a second. And a, a personal statement. Um, and the due date I believe is gonna be February 1st in the coming year. Um, it's always early in spring so that we have time to not only accept and notify students, but that so that they have time to apply for Office of Graduate Studies, OGS, uh, scholarships that are often due in March. Um, and uh, so, so if they get their applications in, if they get their acceptance letters in, in time, they, get, they have time also to apply for those scholarships. So that's why we moved our date earlier. Um, and the personal statement that students write should uh, should give a sense of what subfields of history they're interested in, what are they most interested in, in doing, maybe uh, even what faculty members they're most interested in working with. Uh, and hopefully that would follow on a conversation with a faculty member where they reach out in advance and say, um, I'm interested in coming into the MA program, uh, planning to advise, uh, planning to ask you to, to, to be my advisor, et cetera. And then they can put that into their personal statement. I spoke with Professor So-and-so um, about possibly working, you know, working with them. Um, the more detail that goes into a personal statement, um, specifically about your scholarship, we want to learn about you, uh, but we also want to learn about what kind of scholarship you're interested in. And if you can do that, then that that's going to go a long way uh, to showing us whether you're a good fit for the department um, and the MA program particularly. And that that's a key word, I think, for graduate school applications that may be a little different from undergrad applications. And that is, are you a good fit for this, this program? Because we've had really wonderful students um, who were not a fit. Um, they were not uh, a, a good fit because they wanted to study a subject that we just didn't cover in our department, um, our faculty didn't cover. And so that was, um, that, that, that can happen. Um, and I think that's important that students or do a little bit of preliminary research or a lot on the departments that they're interested in applying to so that in their personal statement, they can be as clear as possible. Um, oh, and, and about um, a related field study, I said, there, there, we have had several students who come in as, um, for example, anthropology or political science or sociology or literature undergrads. You don't have to have been a history undergrad um, again, I, I wasn't. I was an East Asian Studies major. So um, you need to demonstrate um, some kind of ability in uh, history or a related field. Um, and the 3.0 is going to be the, the GPA minimum. Um, and obviously, you know, 
hitting your marks and all those other application uh, materials are going to be important. Yeah, and you were mentioning the letters recommendation, and uh, preferably, I, th uh, I think I think you said uh, two from faculty. Um, so one of the time, you know, a lot of we talk with our, our students, especially if they are interested in uh, going on after their undergrad, let's say for a master's program, and you know, we say get to know your faculty. And I know for some students that can be a scary thing and yeah. nerve wracking. Um, and any advice you have for students of how to connect better with faculty, especially if they might be wanting to ask that faculty member for a possible letter of recommendation? Yeah, I, and, and this is something I, I remember being struck by. At SU This is a big similarity between SUNY Albany and Cal State San Bernardino, where you have a lot of first generation college attendees and college graduates. Um, and that is the, 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 that sort of intimidation factor. And it's unfortunate. And, and I, hope, uh, I hope more and more students will get more and more comfortable with uh, showing up at their faculty's office hours. And that's, that's, a, big, uh, that's a big thing. Um, in in, in any, any faculty's office hours, that's, that's what we're there for, the, the kind of students who are interested in, um, in, in going deeper on a subject and maybe studying it beyond the, grad, the, the undergraduate level. And um, taking it to, you know, take, taking it up to to uh, graduate studies, maybe asking for for letters of recommendation down the road, and that kind of thing is is important. That kind of connection, so that the the faculty knows the students well, the students know the faculty, and when it comes time for for writing those letters, it's a it's it's an obvious yes. Uh, you know, we we know the student. They've gone above and beyond in their work in the classroom, but they've also talked to us about their interests beyond the classroom. Um, and, and that makes it really easy for us to, to say, yeah, of course, and, and we can do it quickly. Um, another thing about, uh, so, so you get to know your faculty. Um, you, you, you go to their office hours. You, you, you talk with them in those, those, those formats. Um, but then you also, when it does come time to ask for the letter recommendation, this is important. Make sure, of course, you give uh, some some people say three weeks. I think two weeks is plenty uh, of time for the for the letter. And if you um, in your initial request for the letter or after the faculty has agreed to write the letter, you, you can then provide some more information. For example, um, you will receive an automated link and it's due by this date. Um, this is the format that, that it needs to be in. Um, and these are the subjects that you need to uh, talk about. Um, or, or if if you don't mind, can you emphasize these these subjects, you know, et cetera? Uh, so that's that's I think a, a an important thing that's going to help um, facilitate the process, making it making it easy as as possible. Um, yeah. So so that's uh, um, that that's really important. Getting into the office hours. Uh, getting to know your faculty and getting your faculty to know you, um, I think is, is important there as well. And of course, you know, we get, a lot of times we get the career question. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe with some of your graduates within the MA in history, um, can you share what they've gone on to do utilizing uh, the master's degree? Yeah, um, this is, uh, this is great. I mean, we hear a, a lot about STEM and, and I think that's great, obviously, uh, and, and crucial. Um, but but history and, and humanities and social sciences uh, are also very much in demand for for a lot of a lot of different jobs, um, and as students quickly learn, so much of what they they learn vocationally, professionally, often happens um, right you know right after they graduate and they or or during their undergrad in in sort of paraprofessional settings like internships and that kind of thing. Um, so I I think. Uh, in terms of our MA program, we've had uh, students go on to to do a number of things. They, they bring their extremely strong verbal and written communication skills to to a number of different um, different different occupations, um, and also, you know, e extremely um, good leadership roles and sort of responsible citizen uh, kind of awareness. I think that, that's that's really important. Um, a lot of our MA students, uh, a fair number of our MA students are interested in teaching at the community college level or returning to teach history and social sciences at the seven to 12 grade level um, and, and doing so because they have the MA with, at, at a higher pay rate. Uh, so that's, that's appealing as well. 
We've had some students who are already teaching at the seven to 12 grade level and come in for our MA program. One thing our MA program offers is many of our classes fit the schedules of people who are working um, nine to five or you know eight to three or something like that. Um, and they can come in and work those, uh, they, they, they can work their, their, their regular teaching job or another job during the day and they can come into our, not all of our seminars or evening seminars, but uh, our core seminars are. Um, uh, so, so working teachers or people who are interested in teaching at the community college or seven to 12 level both. Um, we also have students who are eager to go on to the PhD uh, level, PhD programs. Um, and then teach at a four-year institution, post-secondary. Um, and um, we've had, I think, four or five students who have gone on to do that already. Uh, and that's a large proportion. We only have an average of about 10 per cohort. Um, and they've gone on to PhD programs around the, around the country. A few here close to home at UCR, uh, one up the coast at UC Santa Barbara, one in Mississippi. Um, and so that's that's another another thing that the MA can be a launch pad for. And you can get a sense of whether history study at the graduate level is right for you. And if it is, and if you really hit the ground running and you love it, then, you know, in your uh, uh, the beginning of your second year, you can be applying to Ph.D. programs as well. Um, and as with our undergrads, and I think Professor Jones spoke with you about this, um, there's also a very strong interest in public and oral history and museum work and sort of vocational uh, aspect of history that way. Um, and that's in large part thanks to our really remarkable faculty that can cover those very specific skills to, to uh, prepare people for museum work, prepare people for work in state and national parks and historic sites um, as interpreters and in other capacities. So those, those kind of things are really great. Um, our MA program, like our BA program, can can prepare students for that uh, at, a, at a more advanced level. Um, they can also choose to go on to law school um, where their, their communication skills, written uh, and research skills are gonna be served them very well. Um, also working as editors in the publishing industry. Um, there, there, there are lots of other kind of, uh, kind of jobs that you can, you can enter because your, your, your leadership, your organizational, your communication skills, are all very, very strong based on your work um, as a history major. So, and let's say a student's interested in, in possibly applying for the MA in history, maybe they're on the, on the fence of applying, maybe they're deciding between a couple uh, degree programs or whether they want to go on to do a master's degree. Um, any advice for that student with helping them decide uh, whether to go ahead and apply for the MA in history or or not? Yeah, I, I think that that question of fit uh, that that we, we were talking about before is really important um, at the graduate level. Um, it's uh, in, at, at the undergrad level. Um, there's this sense of you know I want to go to the best school possible, or I want to go to the most affordable school possible, or you know I want to go to the school with a great uh, you know Division One basketball team, or you know whatever it is. Um, at the graduate level, what's very very important is that the program is a good fit for you. Um, and in history, what that means is that the, the time or the, um, the, the era or the region that you're most interested in studying is covered either directly or maybe indirectly by faculty that are, that are in our, our current um, tenure track or tenured faculty. So assistant associate or full professor, uh, somebody there covers, might not, they might not cover exactly what you're interested in, but if you have any question about that, of course, as we said, you can reach out to them. You can ask them. You can say, hey, you know, is this, uh, is this something that, that I could write a thesis on with your guidance? Um, and they'll be very, very frank about that. It may be something really exciting. Like for me, I do modern China, but I'm very excited about doing pre-modern China. I'm very excited about doing, you know, China 2000 years ago. Uh, I also can do modern Japan or modern Korea advising a student on on a subject like that. Um, and that might not be a, immediately apparent from my faculty profile. So if a student were potentially interested in that, I, I hope that they would reach out. Um, and in the same way, you know, we have people who cover, uh, who, who cover Europe or Latin America or, or uh, uh, Africa in different regions uh, and in different times. 
and a student would want to reach out to that faculty member if their interest is in their um, is in their their uh, sort of wheelhouse. So I think another thing, and we we mentioned before, and I just want to emphasize again because it's so important, is to go to the office hours of faculty that you might be interested in working with. Um, and talk to them. And that goes for undergrad programs, goes for grad programs, goes for maybe an advanced class that you're not sure you want to take. So all those all those sort of things are really important. And if you're on the fence, if you're thinking, you know, maybe this is for me, maybe this isn't for me, that's the, that's the key thing that's going to help. Um, and we faculty are really excited about that kind of advising, you know, whether it's whether it's pitching our own department or being really honest about about the fact that that, that this this is not necessarily a fit. Um, and for students who are also on the fence in terms of a topic and they're not sure, also be aware that that talking to a faculty member who studies a related topic may get you excited about another subfield or another era, um, and you can study that uh, directly or in a comparative way, uh, which I also think is, is exciting. And I have a student now studying the Gilded Era of U.S. is the Gilded Age of U.S. history and the 1990s and two, early 2000s in China. So that's a, that's an exciting uh, thing to do as well. So however that however that works, again, the, the sort of bottom line is make sure you're getting to faculty office hours, talking to faculty members, um, and finding out whether it's a whether it's a good fit for you or not. That's definitely great advice. Do you think there's any uh, misconceptions um, that students might have, let's say, about the MA in history or just even history in general? I think about history in general, and I, I used to teach world history, um, and I like to get back to teaching it. I, I, I love um, doing the sort of song and dance for, for, for history and, and getting students excited about history. One of the most important things I say there is that doing good history at the at the undergrad or the graduate level is not about loving history and like loving every era and every uh, region of history. That sounds that sounds exhausting to, to just love all. I always love all history. I, I, I like, you know, sort of being a history buff and saying, OK, I know a couple of cool little little things about everything. And that's fun. That's a sort of, a, you know, a parlor trick. Uh, where you can sort of uh, you, can, you can know uh, some some neat trivia and and help your friends on on pub night you know pub trivia night, um, but histories don't history isn't isn't just you know we we have these these great resources that we can quickly look up facts you know in the same way that that being a sort of human calculator is not what math is about right um, historians don't need to be uh, encyclopedias or they don't need to need to memorize this. It's okay to be more or less interested and expert in different regions and different periods, um, and and actually that's necessary. You know that's the only way you're going to really go uh, uh, in depth on any of these these um, these periods or these these regions. Um, it's good to have that that broad understanding, that broad awareness. It's good to to know um, how different eras fit together, how different sort of macro regions. Uh, connect to each other, um, but you are going to bring your priorities and your preferences to this. Um, now, of course, the flip side is that of that is that you have to identify what those are. What are the regions that really get you excited? What are the eras? Um, maybe the individuals, maybe the the modes, maybe the themes, um, maybe the, the the sort of broader topics that get you most interested, and that can be in a comparative sense. But but that's going to enliven. Um, our classrooms, if you are able to bring that kind of energy, that kind of um, that kind of discipline, you're you're ready to go in in depth on a subject. Uh, and so if you can do that, then then that's going to um, that's going to bring a lot of excitement. So that's the first thing that history isn't just about loving all all history. Um, and and the second thing I think that that's a bit of a misconception about history, historical study, scholarly study is that history study, and I assume this is, this is the same in many other disciplines, um, it can be a, a very social and a very collaborative experience, right? that it's not, um, but that it, it can be a, a, a very social experience. There are obviously gonna be stages of the research and the writing and the editing 
um, that are just you and your books, you and your 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 computer, you and your notebooks. Um, there are going to be some stages of the work that are like that, obviously. Um, but I think what students maybe don't realize and maybe don't make the most of all the time are that there are lots of opportunities to work with a very supportive cohort, very supportive crew. I learned this at UCSD when I was a PhD student there. Um, and uh, uh, working with other PhD students who really put each other through through their paces and really made sure that their work was 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 honest and rigorous and and really called each other out when we would you know uh, make outrageous claims or 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 just reproduce the work of another scholar or something like that, but in a way that was really collegial and was really really also affectionate and and productive and constructive. Um, and I've also so I saw that as a, as a graduate student, but I also saw it. Uh, just in the last three years, especially with the last three cohorts of the of the MA students, um, and it's been really exciting to watch that collaborative effort. And and sometimes they're sharing in their their triumphs. Some of them will get a publication or get a book review published or get a job at a museum or or get into a PhD program or they'll work together on a on a long form piece or a, or a review for the journal for a history in the making uh, student journal, which welcomes MA MA student work, by the way. Um, and and they'll also share in their 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 sort of difficulties and their and their tribulations when they have to read a very very difficult text and they'll all be sort of having a really hard time getting through it. Um, and they'll say, okay, let's you know let's have a meeting. And and in 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 COVID that was uh, an online um, a Zoom meeting or a, 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 a WhatsApp text thread that they would set up or. Um, they would use Slack or something like that, just to just to sort of get their, you know, to, to vent a little bit about a really difficult uh, post-structuralist text that they had to read and was very, very uh, difficult to understand. And um, so that 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 support is something I think that students going into history or scholarship of any kind maybe don't realize is going to is going to be there waiting for them if they look for it. Um, and that is really exciting. I think in terms of the potential for the scholarship. Yeah. And I guess connected to the uh, support, um, my last question is, you know, let's say a student is in the uh, MA in history. So as a grad student, is there anything uh, like your department uh, would, would be able to offer for a student? Yeah, and I hope we can share the links to the, to the history in the making journal. Um, there's a website through our department and there's also the, um, the scholar works page where it gets published. Uh, so it gets published on our history department website, but then we also have a history, we also have a scholar works version of it. And I like that that latter one because when students get their work published on scholar works, they they can go on there and see the journal in PDF form, but divided by table of contents. So you can download a PDF of the article that that you've written or that you've edited or that you've co-written, and you pull it down and it has a cover cover sheet just like a, an article would from JSTOR or Project Muse or something like that. So it looks very, very professional. And it's really neat to use as a, as a um, writing sample if you wanna go onto a PhD program or for your portfolio if you wanna teach at any level or anything like that. So the History Journal is, is a really, really great opportunity for students to, to get their work out there, but then also to go through the editing and publishing process that is so enriching. Um, and it's gonna give them a lot of awareness of, of the field of history scholarship, but also editing and publishing in general. And it's gonna make really great connections. Uh, the kind of networks, kind of undergraduate networks that serve students so well after graduation um, in terms of awareness of job openings and, and training and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's also, uh, on, on that note, there's also the History Club and uh, File for Theta, and that's not a, uh, it's not a social Greek uh, society. That's the History Honor Society. And it's linked to History Club. And it's also linked to the, to the journal, actually, the, the competition for the journal, which the students, which the student editors and authors regularly win. was a national competition through the Phi Alpha Theta Honor Society. Um, so History in the Making is, is sponsored by our local chapter, Alpha, Alpha Delta New chapter of Phi Alpha Theta, the History Honor Society. So students can join that. Um, currently, that the, the advising role rotates, but currently, um, here in uh, 2023, uh, uh, 
Mark Robinson and Michael Karp are the advisors, uh, which is nice. Uh, Professor Karp is out in Palm Desert and uh, Professor Robinson is here on the, on the, in the San Bernardino campus. We do have several scholarships offered uh, through, um, through our department. Um, and there are also some really great scholarship opportunities offered through the Office of Graduate Studies. And those can be, those can be applied for by incoming students and in your first and, and second years. Um, so a lot of uh, a lot of support there. And then finally, um, our MA students also, if they're interested in getting in the classroom in any any form, they can um, get into the supplemental instruction program. Um, that's uh, a program that James Graham has has been leading on our on our campus for a number of years. Um, and that's a really really great uh, sort of a paraprofessional type of work um, that students can do, focusing not on the course content but on um, on study habits, on, uh, on on editing and and uh, writing and that kind of thing. Sometimes it bleeds into um, course content a little bit. Uh, and then there's also ISA work, um, instructional student assistant work. That's that's uh, sometimes involves grading and other uh, clerical type of work as a kind of teaching assistant. So those those sort of things are very good for um, for the resume. Also very good for the experience of of working with a with a faculty member, seeing behind the behind the scenes a little bit, uh, what goes into teaching an effective class and administering an effective class. So yeah, there there are a lot of those those kind of things. Oh, the the, the last thing um, is uh, not the last thing. There's probably a lot more, but the last thing I can think of right now is um, internships. Uh, we do very well placing students with internships, um, and a lot of them lead to really long careers uh, with with various partner organizations, museums and uh, uh, local state national government uh, entities. Uh, we have a student who just headed out to the Fowler uh, Museum at UCLA um, to to take a permanent position there um, in their artifacts. So there's there's lots uh, that our faculty do lots of outreach um, to neighboring institutions and to um, and to, to scholarship and club and that kind of opportunities here on our campus. Again, um, sometimes students need to uh, take the initiative to to find those, to find those kind of uh, entities and those kind of organizations. But when they do, they'll find them very, very rewarding. Thanks. Well, I definitely appreciate your time uh, being on for this podcast episode. A lot of useful information. We'll definitely include those links in our show notes as well uh, for listeners to, to check out. But Dr. Murray, thank you so much again for being part of this episode. Thank you, Matt. It was really a pleasure.